Welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 138. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by the guy who's kind of mental. It's Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. <laughs> well, well, if I'm the, the slightly more mental one, then Mike, that must mean that you're the model of the two of us because I'm, we're I'm, obviously in the mental model series, aren't we? We are indeed. I am just a model citizen and uh, <laughs> I've recovered from the epic nature of Einstein. But Mark, who are we going to delve into today? Whose work are we going to take a bite of and try and digest some pretty heady stuff? Yep. We're picking up the magpie himself, Mr. Shane Parrish, whose book, The Great Mental Models, General Thinking Concepts, is a pretty great almost encyclopedia or collection, Mike, of these great mental models that we're starting to run into with Einstein and some of the other thinkers that we've been touching upon. Yeah, I would have to agree. Uh, I have my copy right by me, actually. Um, and it is indeed uh, encyclopedia-like. It is a great book. So it's called The Great Mental Models by Shane Parrish. And I am so delighted that we have got to spending some time on his work. And you're absolutely right. You said he's like a magpie, um, but he's quite a hawk as well. He's pretty sharp on some of his uh, observations. But what he has done is he's basically created one book for all of us knowledge workers and said, if you want to think better, if you want to perform better through your thinking, here is a guide to a whole body of principles of different models to use. And we saw some of them from Einstein. He actually does mention Einstein in the book a fair bit, but we're going to go beyond Einstein's thinking. We're going to look at some of the best mental models that help you have great insights to challenge assumptions, to break through the status quo, and to come up with big, tasty, original ideas. Mark, this is right up my alley. Yeah, it certainly is up mine as well, because you know, last week we had Einstein. And I think what surprised me perhaps with the Einstein work was how creative and considered he was when he actually followed practices of mental model behavior. And mm. I think really digging into more of Shane Parrish's collection, like you say, is going to be quite surprising and quite interesting as well, because it, we're just sort of narrowing our our minds, aren't we, Mike? Focusing down onto problem solving and being the best version of ourselves day to day. With a book like this, this encyclopedia or roadmap, it feels pretty, pretty helpful. It is not only helpful, I think it's like this idea that like every problem has been thought about previously in history. So imagine rather than looking at a problem in your business, in your startup, in your community group, in your life and saying, I'm stuck, you could go to like a list, literally an inventory of how to think differently. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to do in this show. We're going to give you a kind of a, a taste tester of some of the best models that Shane Parrish has in his book, The Great Mental Models. And we're going to do uh, you know, th what we call an inversion model, first principles. Those are two of the models we're going to use. Then we're going to go really deep into second order thinking and another great one that's in the book, Circle of Competence. And just as a taster, we will even get a sprinkle of Warren Buffett in the show. But moreover, Mark, we're going to really kind of set the scene, set the context for how to think better. And quite frankly, if I think about in my career, I was, wasn't really until my 30s where I was really even aware of mental models. So I'm really hoping um, that the last 10 or 15 years I've spent learning how to think better, that today you and me, Matt, we can like break down these models, share them. And I really do hope our listeners can feel like, uh-huh, that's a great way to think. I'm going to try that. I really think that's what's on offer today, don't you? Yeah, I think you're right. I think if anything, these have become more essential than ever. And if somebody like Einstein, this unbelievable physician, mathematician can use them and find results through following frameworks and mental models, then I think you and I can as well, Mike. Well, in that case, let's crank it up. Let's uh, not only hear from Shane Parrish, but hear not only from Shane, but Adam Grant, and Shane in the same room thinking about thinking. I think one of the things we need to do is we need to give ourselves permission to enter rethinking cycles. 
And there are a lot of ways to do that we could we could talk about. But Shane, I, I'm going to ask you about this because oh, a couple a couple years ago, you wrote a post about how we should have more second thoughts. And I had literally started writing about that. I think it, it must have come out around the time that I was writing the Think Again book proposal. And I, I had proposed a tentative title for this book as Second Thoughts. I was like, this is amazing. You're on the exact same wavelength as me. And this is what you do for a living, right? You, you rethink things. You also ask the Farnham Street community and your whole audience here at the Knowledge Project to rethink a lot of their convictions. So where do you start your rethinking cycles? And how do you know when it's time to enter one? I think like I, I've just summed this up as like outcome over ego. And so I usually try to wrap my outcome uh, or wrap my, my sense of identity or, or ego in the outcome. And that's something I learned when I was working for the intelligence agency, right? Like it wasn't about me having the best idea. It was like, who's got the best idea because that's going to get the best outcome. And then you sort of grow up in an environment where that becomes, I would say, the norm by and large. It's hard in a knowledge environment, though, right? Because you have so much of your your worth. You you want to contribute to something. I think there's a biological need to contribute to something larger than us. And if your identity, you're not mechanically making something. You can't see. There's nothing tangible to what you're producing. Then you 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 effectively are a knowledge worker in one way or another, and then you're paid for your judgment. So if your judgment isn't right, what is it? And then what you do is you 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 force your way, right? Like you you don't intentionally sabotage other people, but you only look for confirming evidence. You you're not open to changing your mind because your sense of identity is tied to being right because that's how you contribute to the organization. It's it's interesting, but not at all surprising to me that that you really learn this in the intelligence community because the way you're describing your process of rethinking is exactly what what I learned from studying super forecasters, right? Which is they they will often come in to making a judgment and say, okay, the only way to have a better shot at getting right, or excuse me, the only way to to have a better shot at at being right, is to recognize all the places where I'm wrong. Yeah. And I, I love this practice in particular that, that came from one of the super forecasters in the book, Jean-Pierre Begam, who, when he forms a tentative opinion, will actually make a list of the conditions under which he would change his mind. And yeah. I've actually started doing this over the, the past few months because I don't want to get locked into something that was, you know, maybe sort of a, a, a soothing belief, but yeah. ultimately one that's not going to serve me well. We used to do that too. We used to sort of like track here are the, the the key variables that are going to drive this, and here's the the range at which we expect those variables. And the moment they go outside of that range, it triggers a, a, a rethinking, if you will, of oh maybe we're wrong, maybe we got this wrong, and now we can course correct. And the earlier we can course correct, a the less costly it is, and b the more likely we're going to be correct in the ultimate outcome. And that's what we were focused on is like not not the um, when you, you're dealing with what we were dealing with, you want the ultimate outcome to be successful. Mm. Adam Grant, Shane Parrish, they can come around to my house for dinner anytime, Mike. It's, it's a little intense. When it gets a little meta with these guys, but I thought what they were getting into was like, if you want to think the best, you have to go to this base idea. It's okay to be wrong. Did you feel that when they were, how we're so busy just trying to prove that we're right rather than accept that we may be wrong and then ask, how do I get better at this idea? It felt like a nice extension of our show on Adam Grant's latest book, Think Again, Mm -hmm. which was um, show 125 um, that we did, uh, well, about 12, 13 episodes ago now. Uh, this idea of second thoughts and questioning your judgment. And I think what's perhaps easy to assume or easy to follow and a behavior that you can kind of repeat is, like you say, to think you're always right. And nowadays we're in a, a community and a lot of us are in jobs where we, as as Adam Grant calls out, you get paid for your point of view, for your thinking. Mm. And sometimes it's quite easy to fall into a pattern of just saying something that's quite easy or giving a point of view that you think is right, but you haven't gone to validate it or question it with anybody else. You haven't really stress test that idea. And what ends up happening is you're, you're probably wasting your opportunity to be part of a good team by bringing forward a good idea or an original Mm. idea by just saying something that you're you're kind of comfortable with, maybe you're safe with, or maybe you think's right, but it's your pride or your ego 
that's getting in the way of it. Yeah. I think we all face this challenge that like we all want to come up with a good, smart idea, but it's, sh- it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to, and what you saw is already this leaning into having the wrong point of view, asking yourself under which conditions would I change my opinion? You know, this is all about robust, critical thinking, logical thinking, thinking that can stand up to the test of time. And what was also really interesting is Shane was talking about, look, I just want the best outcome. If it's my idea or Mark's idea, it doesn't really matter. Once you kind of divert away from me trying to look good and rather focusing on the best outcome, and then you just go in search of the facts, the answers, instead of like, you know, this confirmation bias of, oh, look, that proves my idea is right. And uh, I know there have been moments in my career where I've had this niggling feeling, Mark, that I'm wrong, but my ego prevented me from leaning into that feeling and wait for this. Maybe weeks, months, sometimes years later, I was like, oh my God. I should have listened to it, but my ego was the blocker. So what we're getting into here is these are frameworks and mental models that you can use to avoid those moments. I mean, Mark, have you ever had this moment where you've had this niggling feeling where your thinking's not quite right, but you didn't go there? Yeah, I have. And gradually as, you know, I get older and I'm mature and I'm learning about, for example, these different mental mental models and ways of thinking and working. I'm starting to be more aware of my behavior and my attitude towards things. And only by that penny drop moment of thinking, well, I can control the way that I respond to a certain situation. I Mm. I, I can take ownership of the way I think about things. And, and, you know, like I say, the Adam Grant show on, on Think Again was a big uh, moment in, in my mindset as I, as I thought about my behavior with regards to knowledge projects and so on. And just thinking, okay, well, maybe I can just pause for a second. I don't need to go out and shout from the rooftops that my idea is the best one. Yeah. Because maybe it's not. Maybe I yeah. should take a moment to sense check it or fact check it or ask somebody else to review it before I send it on. You know, I think that's quite a practical way, isn't it, Mike, of actually putting yourself out there and thinking, okay, well, how can I remove my ego? Maybe be a bit more, um, bring in a bit more humility. I can collaborate with somebody on my team and sense check whether my idea is is correct or not. Maybe I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. Yes, and maybe maybe turn it from your idea to our idea. Maybe turn it from a guess to a really well-studied hypothesis. These are all possible for us. And in fact, in the end, if people will come to you, if you can apply the right mental model, what you'll find is you'll be like the, 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 the sage of your team, of your organization, because people will know that when they come to you, they'll be able to think about it, maybe get a different point of view, think it through, reveal some hidden challenges inside of the problem or hidden answers. All of this is in front of us, Mark. So why don't we jump into the first of these mental models? We did a bunch with Einstein, but today we're going to get into to so many good ones. I mean, th- just to prime you, we did the thought experiment. And uh, you remember how Einstein was like, what happens if I could actually run along by a, by a ray of light? That was really yeah. good probabilistic thinking, Occam's razor, the simplest explanation is often the right one. We did all of those. So you're already armed with those, but we have got another four big, tasty mental models. This first one is inversion. And this is all about the capacity to, when you're thinking about a problem, imagine solving the opposite part first. Imagine doing it in a completely 180 degree fashion. So let's have a listen to this mental model that features in Shane Parrish's book, The Great Mental Models, and it is all about inversion. The IFS and what ifs are three thinking methods 
better known as mental models, that help reveal blind spots and uncover creative solutions to problems. The I in what ifs stands for inversion. When you're having trouble solving a problem, try solving the opposite problem first. Instead of asking, how can I make a really good video? Ask, how can I make a really bad video? And instead of asking, how can I be more productive today? Ask, how can I be as unproductive as possible today? Once you've generated a list of ideas, invert them. When I consider how to make a really bad video, I think of using PowerPoint slides with no images or examples. I think of using a monotone voice that will put my audience to sleep. And I think of making the video much longer than it needs to be. When I invert those ideas, I think of making a video with minimal text and plenty of colorful examples. I think of using lots of vocal variety and making the video as short as possible. When I wonder how I can be as unproductive as possible today, I think of sleeping till noon, eating a big stack of pancakes for breakfast that leaves me feeling lethargic, and responding to emails all day. By inverting those ideas, I can plan a highly productive day. That is, I'll wake up at 5 a.m., fast till noon so I can focus better, and only check my email after completing my most important task for the day. Solving opposite problems or deliberately coming up with bad ideas is fun, and it typically gets your creative juices going. Plus, bad ideas are surprisingly valuable once you invert them. The next time you feel pressured to come up with a brilliant solution, use the mental model of inversion. As Shane Parrish says, avoiding stupidity is easier than seeking brilliance. Ooh, the power of inversion, Mike. And it can be fun coming yeah. up with flipping the idea. I love that. I love the like, let's just avoid being stupid. How good is that? <laughs> let's just avoid being <laughs> stupid. And, you know, it, it is a great way to almost warm up your creative muscles, isn't it? Thinking about, okay, well, if we're trying to make the best podcast, how can we make the worst podcast? <laughs> exactly. Now, now I would say, like, let me build on this for a second. Let's say we're both founders and we're going to start this new company. And you can, you know, obviously your desire is to make this wildly, you know, effective, successful startup. But here's the thing. If we said to ourselves, okay, we've done that exercise. Now, right next to that, let's go through the conversation. What would be the most unsuccessful startup look like? You'd run out of cash. You wouldn't have enough people. You wouldn't have the right people. You'd have a product that nobody wants. And what's really interesting is when you identify the, the characteristics and traits of failure, of unsuccessfulness, what you then do is go, uh, it kind of makes you aware of the things you need to avoid in order to be successful. And there's some pretty sharp edges there. Like if you're having real problem explaining your product to the client, that would, that would be really a bad situation. So if that moment happens, what will you, you will have this moment of awareness where you go, oh my gosh, we are literally doing something that we said would be stupid, which is we've got a product we can't explain. So the interesting thing is we have such a bias towards the dreams and the hopes and the aspirations of success that we kind of don't even call out what failure would look like, what a bad, in this case, startup would look like because we're too romanced with all the, all the notions of success. But you can actually specifically call out things that might happen in the organization that you don't want to do because that will be failure. People are not aligned. People can't communicate properly. If you start to see a frequency of this, wah, 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 like the, the, the siren should be going off. You should be freaking out. And what's good, you've already called it out. This is something we need to avoid but we're doing it. I, I just want to come back to something that you, you said just then, because there was a real penny drop moment for me. We are caught up in this romanticism of success. So we avoid even considering failure. But if I was to hop in my car, I'm going to be afraid of crashing it, right? I'm going to be mm -hmm. afraid of mounting the curb or mm -hmm. Whatever, whatever, any any nightmare scenario. So what will happen is I'll pay attention. I'll give it my best go. I'll make mm -hmm. sure that I drive safely. And it feels as though it, it makes no sense to go about business 
unless you're doing it in the same way, unless you think about what the worst case scenario could be. Well, we could get fired or we could create an environment where nobody wants to work with us or we could all fall out and everybody quits. These are all those kind of nightmare or failed scenarios, right. aren't they? And we they can't are. avoid those. They're so important. Yeah. So, so I think here what we're seeing is um, let's say whatever your goal is, you can do this exercise of saying, well, here's what we think needs to happen to achieve that. So you kind of have a vision, then you put a kind of like a strategy in place to kind of realize and you measure the results. You could do exactly the same exercise to say like, if we were to fail completely, what thing, what strategy would we have? What sort of characteristics would we have, whether it's for a business or a sports team. For example, if it's a sports team, success is everybody turning up to training. Success is people don't even know when training is. Hardly anyone's there. We don't have the right equipment. So then you know, from a manager's point of view of that sports team, we need to get all that stuff dialed. Have we told everybody? You know, And I like this because I think we're all rather suffering from degrees of wishful thinking of hope, right? Yeah. And what inversion does is like, let's name the enemy. Let's name failure. Let's paint it in all its glory so that we so acknowledge it that if we ever veer close to it, we're like warning signal and you course correct. Don't you think? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you can only recognize those warning signals when you've considered them, right? Yeah. Okay. We're getting dangerously low. Nobody's aligned. Mm-hmm. Somebody else thinks the product is is completely different to what we've been saying. Okay, ding, ding, ding. These are alarm yep. bells. Yep. Only by considering them can you actually see those turns in the road. But yeah, I we, totally agree. And we have this, when we're working together, Mark, do you notice, for example, let's, uh, let's say someone needs to supply us with some data, with some requirements, with some critical information for a product that we're building. We know that if we've requested it, And let's say we've requested five documents and we've only received two or three. We've instantly know through our inversion process of thinking that the lack of input means that we will struggle for our output to build this wildly new product. So isn't it interesting? As soon as we see those almost inversion-like signals starting to happen, we both are like, oh my gosh, we didn't get those documents. I'm really concerned. It's been a week now. This is a bad sign for us. This is a signal of what uh, failure could look like. Because if we don't have inputs, there's just no way we can produce our outputs, right? Yeah, exactly. You can't solve that problem when those challenges um, still remain. And by imagining or planning in advance of a project in this case, okay, Mm. well, let's make sure that an individual knows how important those documents are, or let's understand why there might be limitations so we can try and help them. These, these are perhaps solutions to the inversion or the opposite problem that mm. we can almost brainstorm leading up to the kind of inverted commas worst case scenario. And it's probably not going to be the worst case scenario that happens, but if you're prepared through the method of inversion for those scenarios that you wanted to avoid, you're going to be far faster, more efficient, and productive when occasional speed bumps come up. Mm, mm, Totally, totally. Now, if you imagine inversion is about, you know, success or failure, you could maybe look at those as left or right. Now I want you to think, Mark, more in terms of top and bottom. And at the very top of kind of mental model thinking is, and, you know, I would almost go as far to say this is sort of the most primary This is the most, one of the most important uh, mental models, and it's called first principles. Now, the interesting thing is, Mark, we will actually do a complete study of this in our master series. So head over to moonshots.io, become a member, because we're going to do a whole show on first principles. But today, right now, we're going to get a little primer, a little introduction to first principles. This is one of the key models in Shane Paris's The Great Mental Models book. And for me, the two great exponents of this in modern entrepreneurial life would have to be Peter Thiel and Elon Musk. First principles are incredibly important because what they do 
is they become these long-term undeniable truths that become a North Star that you can do so many amazing things around. So with that introduction, Mark, I think it's time for us to get into first principles. The F in what ifs stands for first principles thinking. Elon Musk had a problem. He wanted to go to Mars, but acquiring a rocket to get to Mars was simply too expensive. So Musk asked himself, what is a rocket made of? Well, aerospace grade aluminum alloys, plus some titanium, copper, and carbon fiber. Then he wondered, what is the value of those materials on the commodity market? After some research, Musk discovered that the materials made up roughly 2% of a typical rocket price. After a simple examination of the underlying components, Musk saw an opportunity to create a better solution to his rocket to Mars problem. Years later, SpaceX was born. Most people assume existing solutions exist for a good reason and never question them. First principle thinkers don't take existing solutions at face value. They drill down to understand why a solution works. A few decades ago, a group of food researchers liked the taste of meat, but didn't like the idea of harming animals to get their meat. After some first principles thinking, they realized that the fundamental components of great tasting meat was simply a collection of amino acids and sugars, no animal necessary. This discovery led to the creation of the fake meat industry. The next time you're faced with a highly consequential decision or problem, use first principles thinking to examine existing solutions, test assumptions, and understand the fundamental components that make a solution work. Then either go with that solution or use those first principles to come up with a better solution. Yeah, this is really the foundation, isn't it, Mike, of thinking about how to solve a problem and go against your perhaps uh, classic behavior, your traditional mindset of thinking about a problem and trying to approach it. Uh, and, you know, using that Elon Musk example, the natural traditional method was this very costly process that, you know, he, an individual like Elon Musk could never break into. But by drilling it down to its essentials and starting from the bottom up, he was then able to, to enter that space. I think this is a kind of crux point, isn't it? When you're trying to think on how to solve a problem. Yeah, because, um, you know, we can be caught up in the moment and new trends and things that are happening and think, you know, I, I would say an example of being caught up in not first principles thinking is every startup for a while was the Uber of X, Y, Z, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and that that's, not a very profound thought. That's just like, oh, we're just copying something and applying it to a different industry. I think, you know, at the heart of this first principles thinking is like getting to the fundamental truth, things that are absolutely unchanging over a long period of time, because you can really build a, a company or a product an organization around fundamental truths, around first principles. Um, it becomes, you know, if you've built your, your business around the idea of being an Uber for whatever, well, what happens when that model doesn't work very well anymore? You've kind of lost it all. So you'd want to defer back to a fundamental truth. So that's why fundamental truths, these first principles are, are like, they're the bedrocks and there's a great book called Built to Last, which is a whole series of companies that Jim Collins studied that had at their heart first principles. So Matt, let's break down first principles. Like um, where do you see first principles in the world? How do we get them? How do we cook up these first principles in the kitchen? Well, I think the first step I would say is to be aware of trying to change your mindset. You know, like I say, my own experience is one that follows maybe a traditional approach to thinking, to problem solving. And I might initially start with thinking, okay, well, okay, what can I not do? All right, I've got this challenge. We've got a problem. We've got a, a product that we want to go and build. What can't I do? So we're already we're, we're limiting ourselves mm. with how we approach an idea, aren't we? We're closing the boundary. We're locking off the sandbox and we're thinking, okay, well, only in this space, in this country, this region, we can only do X because, you know, maybe the audience isn't here or maybe the taste, the culture doesn't make sense for this particular problem. But I think right away, Mike, that's when 
a first principle thinker would ring an alarm bell, doesn't it? Because we're limiting ourselves by closing off a much larger idea of possibilities. Yeah, because, you know, whether it's the flavor of the day as being the Uber of this or the Airbnb of that, that that's very short-sighted. But if you start with big possibilities and defining new ways of getting there, you're able to think differently because you're focused much more on the first principles than the trend of today, right? And this is, uh, for me, this rigorous way of once you have you know, some basic first principles, then with that clear North Star, you can uh, really invite some different thinking on how you can make those possible. I mean, to think that uh, using first principles, Elon Musk was able to create a rocket that was reusable. And that was considered crazy. And do you remember when we did our Elon Musk show, even esteemed astronauts and people in the space industry that were his heroes criticized him because they didn't have the power of his thinking, did they? No, they couldn't see, <clears throat> excuse me, they couldn't see what he was, he was trying to work for. Instead, they were seeing that closed environment, weren't they? They were seeing the uh, concerns that they had rather than the opportunities and the potential. And I think, you know, the, 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 um, the search for these truths, I think, you know, <laughs> it takes a while to get there. Um, and I think that uh, these principles that are fundamental and undenied can be like so powerful because you can completely disrupt existing industries. And again, to go back to Elon, he just thought about a better way for a car to work. And he's introduced all sorts of things that you know of. But what I was thinking about the other day, Mark, is I don't know if you've seen that the latest up and coming models of uh, Tesla are going, not going to have a circular um, uh, steering wheel. Have you seen that they've got more like a joystick uh, steering wheel? Yeah, I'm trying to think of the right name for it. Um, I, I read it yesterday. You're right. The steering wheel has now changed design for the first time in uh, forever. The yoke is changing, yes. isn't it? So here's the thing. Steering wheels have been the same for 100 years, but because he's going back to the first principles of optimizing transportation, optimizing the automobile experience, he has done all of these crazy things. And yet just this week, another thing comes out yep, the steering wheel has totally changed. And people will criticize him like they criticize Tesla, like they criticize SpaceX because they lack the ability to see the first principles. Pretty powerful, huh? Pretty powerful, pretty huge. And it just shows once a single individual or business can try and stick to that potential, try to make it more regular, try to think about a problem in a different way, they can go out and make a huge the difference within their certain category or business sector company. They absolutely can. And, um, you know, talking about thinking different, we have got some great feedback the last week or two from all of you, our moonshotters, who have joined us on this journey of thinking out loud together. Mark, we've got feedback coming in from all over the globe. Who, who do we need to do a shout out to? I want to give a shout out to David Milanin. Thank you so much for taking a, a listen to us. We're so glad to have you with us, David. Same with Andreas hang on, hang from on, but, all over but, Europe. But Mark, David recommended a, a great author, didn't he? Oh, he did. You're right. Uh, David, apologies. We have not missed out your recommendation of Naval Ravikant. Thank you so much on the long list. We, we love hearing from our listeners, especially with recommendations. So please keep them coming. Now, talking about recommendations, Mark, uh, Andreas, um, he, he, he actually says in his note to us that he hails from all around Europe. So he says, brackets, Bosnia, Croatia, Germany, and Spain, all of which we have quite a few listeners in. So thank you to you, Andreas. And Mark, do you remember he came to us with a classic uh, book recommendation? Yep, absolutely huge classic, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Andreas, again, it's on the list. Thank you for your recommendation and thank you for listening. I've actually read uh, 
think and grow rich is quite a good one. We could perhaps do like a personal wealth uh, series, Mark, but who would we need to confirm such an assumption? Well, I think the only people that we really need to tell you and I um, what to cover is our listeners. You know, you and I, we don't do this each week just to uh, to appease ourselves, Mike. We're doing this for the listeners. So Indeed. listeners, please get in touch with individuals, with books, with recommendations that you have for us to follow because we love coming together. We love doing our research. We love putting together a show for you, our listeners, but it's your ideas and your directions that we want to follow. So please get in touch and give us your guidance. Now, while we're talking about all the moonshutters that are out there in the world, I think we got to give kudos to Canada, don't you, Matt? Yeah, that's right. Andy Ruhung as well. Thank you so much for leaving us a review, a special shout out for you. And we're so glad that you're enjoying us coming together and learning out loud with you each week. Yeah, you know, he, he seems to be pretty fired up, pretty motivated. Um, uh, Andy, he, he really appreciate the, the fact that you reached out to us, gave us uh, another great review online. I think we can never ask you, all of our listeners, uh, too much to ask that you go out and review us on the iTunes um, podcast application or in Stitcher or wherever you're listening to the show. Give us a thumbs up. We really do appreciate it and because it helps more moonshotters find us. It helps us all learn out loud together and get fired up to go out and be the very best version of ourselves. And Mark, if you're feeling a little bit motivated, there's something new in the world that you could go that might just be the turbo boost you're looking for. The turbo boost that everybody's looking for is live via moonshots.io and the member page. Listeners, you can pop along to our member section of the website or pop along and search for us on patreon.com. We have our first episode of the master series live. You just need to become a patron to unlock this post. This is a brand new exclusive episode all about motivation. And boy, Mike, we went deep into motivation, didn't we? I think we dissected decoded motivation for you, our listeners, on the Moonshot Master Series, which is available to you if you become a member at moonshots.io. We've had several people join up, but not nearly enough. I know that you want to get motivated and we will do that job for you for just one dollar a week. So I think that's a pretty good uh, trade-off. And hey, you get to share in all of the workings of the Moonshots podcast. You can make suggestions for shows. You can reach out to us. Uh, It's really easy via Patreon. So go on, go to moonshots.io, become a member, try it out. Check out this, uh, this motivation show. It is a huge deep dive. It's an extended uh, show. It's 90 minutes. It comes with frameworks and downloads and goodies, and you can um, get it all from moonshots.io. I mean, the downloads alone are pretty handy, Mike. I mean, I've had them to my side ever since we did the show and before, and they're just really handy to refer back to when I'm considering how to to find motivation. And I'm really excited for episode two on first principles. I think today you and I have dug into just a little bit of a taster from Mm. Shane Parrish, but Mm. episode two on the master series for first principles, I cannot wait. Yeah. And, you know, once you've kind of thought up and down, you know, first principles, once you've thought success and failure, what it looks like, you're really getting warmed up into the mental models world. And you can apply different mental models in different ways. And in this new twist in the mental models plot, we're going to look at second order thinking, which is all about going deeper. And this is one of the real highlights of the book, The Great Mental Models by Shane Parrish. And I really like this because I would admit that I sometimes fall for the temptation of thinking I've got the idea at the first principle. I got it. No problem. I thought about failure. I've thought about success. But often when we create brand new things in the world, we need to go a level deeper. We need to understand the consequences that may happen, the unintended, the unexpected consequences. And how many times in the world do we see people doing things and it causes these knock-on effects that nobody 
thought about and we've got all this drama. Well, there's a mental model for this and it's called second order thinking. After World War I, the British and French forced Germany to disarm, give up territory, and pay reparations that would be worth roughly $500 billion today. The British and French got what they wanted, a weak Germany that could not wage war again, or so they thought. The British, French, and other Allied powers failed to consider the second-order effect of their actions, namely fueling the rise of fascism in Germany that would lead to far more destruction in World War II. Second-order thinking gets you to think beyond the outcome you're going for and consider the reaction to that outcome. It's important to incorporate second-order thinking in your decisions to avoid disastrous unintended consequences that come from second-order effects. If you're a CEO of a company and you demand that everyone comes back to your office after a year from working at home thanks to COVID, you might get what you want, namely improving the culture with everyone back together. But your actions might have the second order effect of getting people to realize how much they hate commuting to work and miss the convenience of working from home. Those people might lead the company, which could ultimately destroy the culture. Before implementing any solution or making any important decision, do some second order thinking by taking a minute to simulate what the reaction to your solution or decision might lead to. I love this mental model because it really challenges you <laughs> when you're thinking about solving or coming up with a, with a solution. And the natural, I suppose, reaction is, okay, great, cool, done. I found the issue. I found the solution. Pack up my bags, wash my hands. I'm out of here. But actually, my, this, this challenge to yourself and thinking, okay, well, let's think about the knock-on effect. Let's think about the, the consequences or the splinters that might happen from making this one decision, this solution. What might happen for the partners that we work with? What might happen to our workers? What might happen to their motivation on the next project? I love this idea of thinking about all the different knock-on effects, all the dominoes that might happen from that first solution that you've chosen. And forcing yourself to come back and think, okay, well, let me just check. Let me just rethink that second order thinking and why that might be my first solution. Yeah. So let's, let's throw around some examples of second order thinking. And the one that comes to mind, this is completely random. It just always bugs me when I'm out and about in my neighborhood. So um, I'm in, uh, you know, Mark and I live in the very sunny city of Sydney, Australia, and it's, you know, it's a pretty big city. It's like, I don't know, six, seven million people, huge geographic area. And it always just surprises me so much that when urban neighborhoods build large apartment blocks and they fail to think about traffic and parking conditions as a result. So what happens? So you've had... A, uh, an existing urban neighborhood that's maybe, you know, 10, 20 minutes from downtown. They put in these massive apartment blocks and then it's instant congestion because they haven't done second order thinking. So what second order thinking would be like, hey, great, let's build a new um, apartment block. Let's house more people. Let's be more efficient with that. Okay, not a bad idea. But then they don't go and identify future consequences of this decision. And then what you would want then do is look about, look at all those different factors and go, well, hang on with all these people. Do we have a bus stop? Do we have a train station? Do we have underground parking? Is there, do we have the right turnoffs in that neighborhood? So what happens is the developer of, of this apartment block, well, they get their job done, but then go on to cause all these unintended consequences. For me, it was a, another great example. The Olympics are on at the moment. Everybody goes and says, let's build amazing sports facilities for the Olympics. But then they don't ask themselves the famous, famous mistake with Olympics developments. What are you going to do with it when it's finished? Yeah. <laughs> And actually, Mark, you know, it's quite uh, well known now that uh, if you host the Olympics, it's a guaranteed money loser. Because you spend so much time building the infrastructure. That it's doesn't then over within, well, how yeah. long is the Olympics? Two, three weeks long? Yeah, maybe a month. Maybe right? a month. Yeah. So it's, that would be second 
order thinking. What are the consequences and of what we're doing? What would happen on the second and third level? If that's happened, then what? And what are the risks associated with that? I think that's a great example of the value of doing second order thinking. You're right. It serves the individuals, the architects, the builders, whatever, whoever created that, that, um, that building, let's mm-hmm. say, mm-hmm. but without questioning, okay, well, what's going to be that knock and effect? That's a really nice visual way of, of demonstrating the value of the second order thinking. I mean, for me, Mike, another example that I would probably run into quite easily with, with day-to-day work might be making a deci- decision about a product. So I might think, okay, well, we found out uh, certain pieces of information. It serves us because we know how to build it. It serves our client because that's kind of what they want. But we haven't necessarily considered what will be the knock-on effect of uh, only following our instincts here. You know, we haven't necessarily tested maybe other ways of building it, or maybe we haven't tested the changes that we could bring in from working with customers, perhaps. Do mm-hmm. you think that that's a, another example, maybe, of a second order thinking? Yeah, it's thinking about if you do something, what are the changes, the knock-on changes, the knock-on consequences that it's going to create, and then saying what are the risks associated with that? What would be the implications? So if you build a new house or build a new apartment, what are the transport considerations? What are health and safety? What kind of services would they need? What's going to happen when we get, go from a, a, a plot of land that housed maybe five families to housing 50 families in an apartment mm. block? Do we have utilities and services that can provide to that uh, quantity? There's all those sort of second order thinking, what is the consequence of this future state. If we do this, what's the knock on? Very, very important because how many times do people go and build these uh, really elaborate Olympics villages? And then I think it was Brazil. I mean, they, they've, they've had to tear down half of it. Some of them turn into ghost towns and they spend billions of dollars because they didn't have second order thinking. So this is where you can see in real life, in business, in your personal life, second order thinking. If you say, hey, let's have a kid. All right. What second order thinking is, well, can we still live in this place? Do we have the services? How does it fit in with work? You know, like how, like this is second order risk consequence to your actions. And it just, you know, the classic one is, you know, when people build things in physical spaces, you know, shops, offices, factories, and then they fail to think about the consequences that they have. And remember, Mark, this is just second order thinking. How much are we able to riff on this? First principles thinking, like the art of getting to the highest fundamental truths, inversion, thinking opposite in order to avoid the wrong outcome. I mean, this is so great. And Mark, if people are like, whoa, whoa, these guys are covering a lot of ground. It's super strategic. Where would be their home base if they want to collect their thoughts and go back over all the things we've discussed? You can pop along, listeners, to www.moonshots.io, where you can find all the information about today's show on Shane Parrish's The Great Mental Models. We'll have our show notes, as well as a collection of video clips that have helped us really grasp the concepts of the great mental models. And also you can find our transcript, our past shows, archive, as well as our upcoming shows in the series as well. So a bit of a bit of a plethora. Maybe this is our our encyclopedia, Mike, moonshots.io. <laughs> Absolutely. Now we've still got a couple more clips to go. And I think you want to hit us with the who they call the sage from Omaha, right? The sage from Omaha has the honor of introducing our next clip, or perhaps we have the honor of hearing from the sage of Omaha. And this is another great mental model that Shane Parrish popped into his book, The Great Mental Models. And it's all around the circle of competence. I was genetically blessed with a certain wiring that's very useful in a highly developed market system where there's lots of chips on the table and uh, you know I happen to be good at that game. Ted Williams wrote a book called The Science of Hitting and in it he had a uh, picture of himself at bat and the strike zone broken into I think 77 squares. 
And he said if he waited for the pitch that was really in a sweet spot, he would bat 400. And if he had to swing at something on the lower corner, he would probably bat 235. And in investing, I'm in a no-called strike business, which is the best business you can be in. I can look at a thousand different companies, and I don't have to be right on every one of them or even 50 of them. So I can pick the ball I want to hit. And the trick in investing is just to sit there and watch pitch after pitch go by and wait for the one right in your sweet spot. And if people are yelling, swing you bum, ignore them. There's a temptation for people to act far too frequently in stocks simply because they're so liquid. Over the years, you develop a lot of filters. And I do know what I call my circle of competence. So I, I, I stay within that circle and I don't worry about things that are outside that circle. Defining what your game is, where you're going to have an edge, is enormously important. Enormously important. I couldn't agree more. Knowing what a winner looks like for you in your day, what work you should do, what you're naturally born for. And equally, what Warren's talking about there is when you see something that you know is not in your circle of competence, avoid the temptation of trying to hit a ball that you're not designed to hit because your odds of success are drastically reduced. I love this circle of competence thing. It's so good. Yeah, that that's huge. Don't worry about things outside your circle. Is it's it's quite a, a a consistent message, I think, that also came up, Mike, when we did a lot on stoicism with Ryan Holiday. Mm -hmm. I think you know where Warren is showing us there is you know in investing, and I love the this this sports field analogy with baseball. Mm -hmm. I, I totally I can visualize that very very clearly in mm. my mind, but I also see the connection with um, anxiety or worrying about things that are outside not only your circle of competence, you know, your knowledge, but mm -hmm. also your control. You know, the circle of competence, I think, includes things that I can action, that I can react to mm. and maybe influence. So it's almost a kind of circle of competence and influence, I guess, is where my mind goes. Yeah. And that I, I think is a real valuable thing to remember, isn't it? You can't, there's no point in worrying or getting too stressed about things that are outside your circle of competence because you can't control them. Exactly. And, and I think it's also about designing an environment and a day, a week, a month, designing a role for yourself, both personally and professionally, where you're at your best, where you really know the subject matter, matter you're really comfortable with it, and you can have a, a degree of control over it. You know, this to me is what's exciting. So what happens for you, Mark, when you think about your circle of competence? Well, I, th I think it starts by having awareness, doesn't it, of what I can um, confidently do and I can do with a level of competence and therefore being aware of perhaps the things that I'm not so good at. So combining, mm -hmm. you know, the circle of competence and maybe even the second order thinking and, and knowing, okay, well, here's something that I maybe am a bit weak on. That's okay. Yeah. Know that it's, that it's something to be improved on, upon. The, the circle of competence, I think, Mike, can grow, can't it? I can grow my circle and become maybe more competent in different things. Yeah. But having, it starts with awareness, doesn't it? And I think, how do you know to unlock that process you just described for us? How would you start? to answer the question, to know what you're good at? Well, I think it comes from collaboration. I think working with others will help me understand if, I've, if I'm good at a certain thing, because I can ask them for feedback. You know, that, that'll be something that's immediately available, perhaps to a lot of our listeners as well. Mm. You know, advice, feedback. Okay. Um, Elon Musk calls it out in, in our previous show with Albert Einstein, um, you know, where he's referring to the value of physics in, mm. in his work and as well as the advice and, and advice from friends and family. I think that's a real um, first stage yeah. at, at not knowing it, but also um, something more practical, write it down. See if you can describe the product in question or the 
methodology or the practice in a really simple way to another person. Or maybe you can write it down on a piece of paper. And if you can do it very, very clearly, maybe you know what that product is all about. Maybe you can demonstrate that that knowledge is settled in your mind by trying to describe it to somebody else. Uh, I, you know, obviously I totally get you with like, you know, if you want to understand something, you know, teach it, right. <laughs> you know, um, so sharing it as an, as a proxy for that, I would, um, add to what you said and say, ask yourself today, where did you feel that you were working in a natural way where the work came naturally to you? Not necessarily easy because it was, there was work to do and you had to like get going and be productive, but where did your work feel natural? What are the times in your day? What are the things and the activities that you do where you feel good? Um, there might be a lot of it to do, or the, there might be some complexity, but you, you fundamentally feel good. How do you know when you feel good? You start to get in a bit of a flow state, or maybe you look forward to the work, or maybe you're you know, you have a sense of satisfaction or pride when you complete the work. I think if you want to know where your circle of competence is, you must ask these questions of when are you at your best during the day, identify the pattern within those and say, okay, how do I spend more hours of my day doing these things? Yeah, you can talk to people, but study yourself, unlock where you feel like you're Superman, you're doing the thing you were born to do. And I like the reminder that it's not always easy. You know, it's not going to be something where you're working in an easy manner. It's a way that feels natural to you. I like that distinction that you called out. Yeah. Yeah. So just get into that self-discovery and, you know, find out where you're really feeling good about the things you do, where you feel at your best, where you're having the most impact, you're doing stuff that matters, that people love and matters to them as well. And then you're really sort of locking into not only your circle of competence, but your purpose as well. And I feel like, Mark, with that said, it's time to round out things with Shane Parrish. And we've got some thoughts from the author himself talking about the people you should surround yourself with. In order to expand your mind, you need to be around people who think differently than you. Um, how do you actually recommend people access these individuals who think differently? So, so Wade is asking, how can someone like me meet someone who thinks differently? Like, how do I find these other crowds or individuals who maybe are overlooked? Um, because we tend to naturally surround ourselves with people that think and act like us. Yeah. So, I mean, there's never been a better time alive to do that than right now, right? Because you have access to Twitter. Uh, and other social media where you can follow, literally follow almost anybody in the world. And so what you're looking for when you're following people is people you attend to disagree with. Uh, they might offer, but you respect, right? So people who articulate how they're thinking, why they're thinking things, but don't offer an opinion that's different than yours. And people that surprise you, like that, that surprises me. I don't agree with that worldview because it, it doesn't compute with what I think the world looks like. And those are moments that most of us gloss over, but those are the moments you want to dive into if you're trying to think better. And I think that it's really important that you explore those and uh, you can follow crazy you know, I, I wouldn't follow like just if you're left wing, follow right wing people, or if you're right wing, follow left wing people. That's not enough. That's not thoughtful. And that's sort of like convincing yourself you're doing the work without doing the work. You want to find somebody who thinks differently than you, but you respect the way they think and they're articulating the reasons they think and they're opening up their thought process to you because that's how you're going to learn. And at work, you want to do the same thing, right? It's not enough to just find somebody above you in the organization. I mean, that's a lazy approach to sort of like getting better. It might actually be effective for getting a promotion, um, but it's a lazy approach to thinking better. You want to find the people closest to the problem and you want to start developing your associative memory. You don't want to develop your direct memory. And so if you think of computers, computers use direct memory. You need an exact match to see the problem. You, our brains use associative memory. We, we're intuitive machines. We match imperfectly and you want to start intelligently preparing to build up that intuitive memory. And one of the ways that you intelligently prepare your associative memory is you start going to the root of the problem, right? So you start talking to the people closest to the problem. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to vacuum up these 
details of the problem. So you're trying to vacuum up not what the person thinks you should do or what the solution is, but you're trying to vacuum up their experience into your brain so you can start making connections that other people can't make. And um, that's sort of like how you, it's like, I mean, there's, it's a journey. There's no, there's no end to it. There's no destination, but that's the, the slog of like how we learn to think better. Shane Parrish ringing us home, Mike, with associated memory, intuitive memory. And I'd say demonstrating the power of, of all mental models, being able to create these new memories and these new reactions that your mind has to certain situations in life. Finding that route. I mean, that's, that's kind of first principles, right? Yeah. And, you know, building off what he was saying, you know, earlier, like, you know, outcome over ego, he's, He's also saying here, don't just search out people that are going to agree with you. Go to the people closest to the problem. I think that's really, really powerful because sometimes we're all finding it a bit uncomfortable if someone says, well, I don't agree. I think of it differently. I think you're wrong. But imagine if you could say, great, tell me more. Explain that to me. I mean, embracing difference from people and the way they think only makes us stronger, doesn't it? Yeah, only by being exposed and finding, you know, maybe maybe those uncomfortable conversations, Mike. You know, you, maybe you could extrapolate it as far as to say finding individuals that have a different point of view to you is kind of like embracing a situation that it doesn't come easy to you. So right. Finding yourself in a situation that kind of pushes your boundaries a bit, mm. makes you feel that little bit uncomfortable is mm. really good for you in the long run. And I think it's the same with, with people, much like you've just said, if I'm around individuals who have a different point of view, my brain will grow because it's hearing these different ideas, ideas that perhaps I've glossed over in the past. And instead, by being exposed to them, I'm making those new, new memories, new synapses and so on. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. And boy, it's, it's really heady stuff. I mean, just think about it. We started with Shane Parrish chatting with Adam Grant. I mean, talk about two moonshot favorites in the same room. We got four big, uh, uh, mental models and, uh, a call to arms to follow people that you respect, go straight to the problem, um, and embrace people that disagree with you. My question for you, Mark, as always on the Moonshots podcast is which one has sparked your interest the most? I think the one that sparked my interest the most has to be first principles. It's got to be first principles and how to come up with that better solution by drilling, drilling, drilling. And Mike, I just can't wait to really get into the next master series episode on first principles. Very tasty stuff. And if you want to know more about anything that we discussed on this show, you head over to moonshots.io. Mark, I want to thank you for coming on this great mental adventure, this journey into mental models. Um, I hope you're feeling um, fired up to think about thinking. I I think, (laughs) I, I think that I am. I think I am. And I'm ready to go and put some of these mental models into practice today. Fantastic. Well, thank you to you, Mark. Thank you to you, all of our listeners, the moonshotters out there who are joining us on this adventure of thinking out loud, of really wrapping our minds around these great mental models. And we did that today with Shane Parrish and his book, The Great Mental Models. And it started with this whole notion of put the outcome before your ego, to invert things, try solving the opposite problem first and apply lots of fundamental thinking, lots of first principles. And then we can move forward, forward into the future. We can think about second order consequence, the risk associated with these new things that we might do. And we might make sure that we're hitting the right ball. We're doing it as Warren Buffett would have us do, being in our circle of competence. And if we do all of those things, You can be on the way to great thinking and great thinking will lead to action and great outcomes. But you must surround yourself with people that are close to the problem, people that you respect and embrace people that disagree with you. If you do that, you will have not only thought 
about how you think. You will have improved the judgment calls that you make, the impact that you have on yourself and the people around you. And boy, is that moonshot thinking if I ever heard it. So once again, thanks for joining us on the Moonshots podcast. That's a wrap.